talking, uh, we're getting into specifics of how to apply some of the principles that we've been learning to various aspects, particularly various genres, which we'll be talking about of the New Testament. Next week we will talk about interpretation of the Old Testament. Today, in particular, we'll be talking about a number of genres that are um, present in both the Old and New Testament, and how we, if any particular guidelines we need to take into account when we consider those, and then the New Testament as well. Um, this is the class. You will notice the test is not next week. <laughs> Today, interpreting New Testament. Next week, interpreting Old Testament. Applying the principles is the first hour of March 19th, and March 19th, the second hour is when we have to test. So I'm hoping all of you, as we always say, are planning on studying the what you need to know notes and then um, take the test. Even if you're not doing this for credit, you will learn it better. You will learn the material better if you study the materials that I just made available to you and if you plan to take the test. Okay? Any questions about any of that? And as always, the test is 50 uh, multiple choice questions. I think this, this is one of the longer study sheets I've done because I sort of broke it out by individual principles, like the rule of genre and that sort of thing, is each a different one. But um, still 50 questions, multiple choice, no essays, and you, you only have to know this stuff well enough to recognize it. You don't have to be able to you know, fill in the blank or do an essay question or anything like that. So that's why I encourage you to do this. Uh, that is setting take a test. All right. The real principle we're talking about here, biblical interpretation, before we get into interpreting genres, um, both both shared by both Old and New Testament and the New Testament. We're starting New Testament. Next week we'll get into Old Testament stuff. But biblical interpretation, the long definition, which I put together from a number of different sources and my own thoughts, um, biblical interpretation is the process of finding the purpose, meaning, and right application of a passage of scripture through the study of the cultural, geographic, and historical context of the original writers and audiences, literary genre and forms, textual sources and variants, language structure, word meaning and grammar, and theological harmony within scripture. No, nope. Scripture is the best interpreter of scripture, particularly when you're dealing with difficult passages. The, the first thing you ought to be be saying is, well, what does the rest of Scripture say about that? If you think you have an understanding of Scripture or you, you pursue an interpretation of Scripture which is inconsistent with something else you find in Scripture, then that's the first warning bell. You know, you need to then back up and say, Scripture is not, we believe, in, in any way internally inconsistent. And so that's especially why you use the rest of Scripture to help you understand the difficult passages, because uh, we have to have the theological harmony. But we're looking for meaning. You know, what, what was the purpose for which Scripture was given to the original author, and why has it come down to us two millennia later? What is the meaning behind it, and how do we apply it to our lives? That's what biblical interpretation is all about. Okay. Now, in particular, we want to talk today about interpreting biblical genres, because the biblical genres are one of the most important ways to understand the approach we take to any given passage. The Bible contains many different genres, or a, a, a genre is a literary type characterized by a, style, a particular style, form, or content. When we, we'll talk about some of these today. Uh, poetry is one of the genres in Scripture. It has a very particular style, form, and content. Apocalyptic literature we'll talk about today. Uh, same thing, very particular style. And even in the definition of apocalyptic literature, we'll look at that. And we need to be able to recognize that in order for us to be able to understand how rightly to interpret um, examples of biblical genres. The most, the most common biblical genre, which is 60% of the whole Bible, both Old and New Testament, is historical narrative. They are telling us the history of God's interaction with his people. First the Jewish people, and then those followers of Christ. There are genealogies, hyperbole, which are uh, exaggerated statements in order to make a strong point. When Jesus says, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he doesn't expect us to really be perfect. But he says it in that way so we know it's really important and we really need to make the effort. We use hyperbole all the time. You know, I'm starving to death. Really, let's get you to the hospital and get you on liquid nutrients immediately because, you know, before you die. We use those kinds of expressions constantly. Well, Scripture uses them as well, and we need to be aware of that. Prophecy, 
Um, we'll talk about prophecy today. Poetry I mentioned. Uh, covenant literature. There is a whole covenant theology approach to interpreting scripture because all the Old Testament means quite literally the Old Covenant. New Testament means New Covenant. The two great covenants God made first with his people, uh, the Hebrew people, and then that he made available to all people through Jesus. So covenant literature as a genre. Proverbs and wisdom literature. Uh, psalms and songs. A psalm is another word for song, but uh, we don't think of them as songs often. We think of them more as poetry, but they really are lyrics to songs. Um, letters, the epistles of the New Testament. And then I mentioned apocalyptic literature. Daniel is a great example of that in the Old Testament, the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Now, we, we need to recognize um, what the genre is to interpret any passage properly. Misunderstanding the genre of a book or passage can lead to a skewed interpretation. Let me give you some modern examples of that. If I started, if I said, okay everyone, once upon a time, what genre is that? Fairy tale. You all know that. Right? We thought it was going to be hard. You immediately... <laughs> Okay, you have a special test. <laughs> Next week! <laughs> if, if I got a piece of literature, and again, the genre is, is reflected in literature, but I got something and it said, Mr. Arnold, you have just won, you might just have won $10 million! What is that? What's that? Direct mail. In fact, it's probably Publishers Clearinghouse or something yeah. better. Now, um, if I get something in the mail and it says, you know, it's written and it says, final late payment notice. What genre is that? Obviously, it's a notification that I haven't done something I should have done. If I don't recognize the difference between, Mr. Arnold, you might have just won $10 million and final late payment notice as different genres, is that not going to get me in trouble? Yes. Okay, because one of them, my tendency is to go like this, but if I do that, with the final late payment notice, then I'm in trouble, or will be. <laughs> so, in very much the same kind of way, if we don't recognize the genre, then our reaction to it in terms of interpretation, how we want to apply it, etc., is very likely to be skewed. We are going to make an error in that regard. And so genre is very important. Understanding the style, a particular literary type, that is reflected by style, form, and content. Okay? Now, <laughs> It's also true that intentionally mislabeling a genre has sometimes been an underhanded way to deny the text's truthfulness. Particularly, Rudolf Bultmann and others identified uh, scripture as myth, that it is the great God myth. And by that they meant, well, yeah, there may be some truths found in it, but you can't really take it literally. Now that, in, that by the way, implies a, a wrong definition of myth. C.S. Lewis who was a literary scholar, I mean, he was a medieval and renaissance literary scholar, he rightly, uh, in his books, talks about the fact that myth is something which conveys a truth greater than what is on the surface. In other words, there's a deeper truth to it, whether it is factual or not. A myth can be factual or non-factual. It can be true history or not. It can still be a myth, because the definition of myth isn't true or false, like we usually think. It is, does it have a greater meaning behind the story. So, but many times, liberal scholars or skeptics have tended to try to use mislabeling of genre in order to try to discount, oh, you know, you can't read that literally because it's just all figurative symbolic language. It's just, a, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just a nice story. Okay, that's a genre issue. Yes? Um, just out of curiosity, I, I think I thought a myth was, um, something made up. And that's wrong. Right, but <laughs> that's, that's what most people think. <laughs> like like little fairy tale, like little fairies and uh, dragons right. and things like that. They were just a myth. They weren't real. That was somebody's in their mind. That, it's exactly what I was saying is myth to most people means untrue True. or made up. Right. That's not technically what the meaning of myth. Ah. Myth means some story that has within it or behind it a much greater truth that can be learned whether it's factual or not factual. So don't be confused by that. When you read the word myth in anything, you need to pay attention to the context because often today it is used to mean 
something that's not true, something that was made up. But if you read scholarly things, or C.S. Lewis, for instance, then they will use the proper definition of myth, which is something, a story, uh, something that has a larger, bigger meaning. doesn't matter whether it's true or not true, factual or not factual, historic or not historic. Okay? Great, but had I seen myth with C.S. Lewis, I still might have been interpreted on my only meaning that I've ever known, which is, oh, non-factual. Which is why I just explained that. Right. But <laughs> so that you won't do that again. <laughs> I, I won't, but had you not told me that, 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 that still would have been more. Well, there, there are a lot of things that in, any of us, yeah. um, because of a lack of understanding, we misinterpret things. Yeah. The reason we're talking about different biblical genres and how you need to see them and how you need to interpret them is because in the absence of understanding this, you're going to get it wrong. Well, in the absence of understanding the proper definition of myth, you would probably get wrong. If you read C.S. Lewis and he refers to something as a myth, then you don't know that he's talking from a technical point of view as a, as a medieval and renaissance literature uh, authority, then you wouldn't understand that he's not saying this is, this is made up, that this is not factual. Just so you understand, the common use means made up stuff, not real. But that is not truly the definition of the word myth. When In the ancient times, when they talked about the great myths, you know, of Hercules and all of that, some people believe those were true. You know, that Hercules really did live and he really did do all those things he's supposed to have done, but, but people who didn't believe it was true, they still thought there was a great truth behind that. It had to do with understanding, you know, courage, you know, the quest, the willingness to take on challenges in order to defend the weak, all those kinds of things. And those were true whether you believed that Hercules was, had been a real being or just a made up being. And so myth, that's the real definition of myth. Yes? Joseph Campbell says it just in a very simple way. He says myth is a story that tells something which is so profound it cannot be told in any other way. Mm -hmm. And right. so, you know, if the meaning is so, so great. Right. Yeah, and all of the, yeah. earlier I started with Once Upon a Time, virtually all of the fairy tales, there is some great truth behind them. And yeah, they're made up, but they're, they're mythological in the sense that they have some greater truth. Much of them having to do with the quest and the underdog defeating the, you know, the evil powers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, because he was a literary expert, uh, Lewis was very big on the idea that that children learn far more from stories about dragons and you know and brave victors than they do about from purely from mathematics and you know and science. Not to say that those things are bad, but some of the greatest truths that we need to learn we learn from mythology, whether it's historically factual or not. Okay, but we've sort of lost that in recent times. Yes. I think one of the greatest myths is that you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find the answer. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Right, and on some days you're a princess uh, frog. I, I, I'm speaking for Carolyn there. Okay. So, frequently they will, skeptics and bad scholars and those who wish to deny the truthfulness of Scripture will sometimes mislabel the genre in order to convince, to change the way you look at it, to change the way you are inclined to interpret it. Okay, Flora? Right. Well, I, I just wanted to ask that. If, if we're taught one way in the Western world and in the Eastern world we're taught another way where mathematics and those sorts of things um, are different, would this alter how, how they would view the text as well? Where they're coming from? Actually, there would be more of an inclination in the, in the Eastern cultures to understand what we're talking about here than there is in Western culture. For instance, there's more of an inclination on their part to believe that science is not the end-all and be-all of all things. That, in fact, there is great truth to be experienced in story. Now, that's very much, you know, that's something that we've lost in the West because we have, you know, we're so given to scientism, that is, that science is the only source of truth, and materialism, and, you know, um, that, that sort of thing, non-supernaturalism. Whereas it's much easier in Eastern cultures for them to understand that, that there is, there's greater truth in the story, often, than there is in the science. And that there, you know, that, for instance, it's the reason why it's so much harder to evangelize people in the Western world, that is, I'm talking Western Europe, um, North America, 
than it is people in Asia and Africa and parts of South America because they're still very open to the fact that supernatural things can happen. You tell them the story of God, you know, God becoming a human being, they don't have this immediate you know, rejection of it for scientific reasons. They are open to that because they understand that some of the most important things are not things that you can count or that you can define scientifically or that you can do physical experiments on. So, yeah, if anything, the Eastern cultures would be more ready to recognize different types of story, different types of literary forms, and that they carry very important meaning. Whereas in the West, again, the skeptics would say, oh, well, this is, this is about stuff that can't possibly happen, you know, because it's, Jesus couldn't have walked on the water, he couldn't have stilled the storm, he couldn't have raised the dead, he couldn't have fed 5,000 people with a, little, you know, a couple of loaves and some fishes. Um, well, we believe he could. But we have to have a right way of interpreting that. Those are the sorts of things that people in, in non-Western cultures have a great... Uh, it's much easier for them to understand those things, to believe that, that those extraordinary things can happen than it is for us. And that's why evangelistic efforts are usually much more productive in developing parts of the world. Yes? Just, yeah. just um, a question, please. Um, I was told that it's very um, non-Christian to read Harry Potter because of wizards. That's stupid. It's not a lot. It's stupid. Yeah. Um, More Christian. Because mythology. I mean, there are people who go so far as to say you shouldn't read the Chronicles of Narnia because there are dragons and witches in it. <laughs> Makes me want to blow a gasket. Um, I was actually told this by the church. Yeah. Well, the church was wrong because. There's a difference between reading that, see the thing, between reading story of that sort, and sometimes it's just enjoyable, versus, and understanding that, you know, the Harry Potter story, ultimately, the witchcraft is just a device. It's about the struggle between good and evil. It's about the fact that evil can seem strong, and when goodness is weak, if goodness is still, is, is, still dedicated and committed and loyal and really willing to fight the, what looks like the impossible fight, then even the weak can overcome. That's the story of Jesus, who came as a baby. The, the, the basic principles behind the Potter stories are the basic truths of all great mythology. It is the defeat of the great evil by the weaker but uh, committed sources of good. Um, the, the, you know, the which Witchcraft stuff is just a, a mechanism. It's just a vehicle, and it's it's. I would I would have more trouble with somebody you know with the same stories if it was a purely somebody who was who his whole orientation to life with science than I would Hogwarts school of wizardry you know kind of thing. So I I simply think that's wrong. Now when we start trying to be a wizard, when we start trying to gain magical powers in order to subvert the natural order that God has, has created, then we have a serious, serious problem. All right, I, and I am not, I'm not one to say fool around with the occult, I'm not one to say that witchcraft, in any sense of the practice, the real practice of it, is in any way acceptable, it is not. Scripture is very clear about that. But there is, there are light years of distance between reading stories where witchcraft is just a literary uh, device that is used in order to tell a great story which is true, and that is, the battle against good between good and evil, versus actually trying to become a wizard or a witch or whatever else it is. Okay, that's and that's that's never acceptable. But the idea that people reject, and again, some people have said that C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia are evil, and I'm thinking, I really doubt that you're going to be in heaven when we get there. <laughs> if that is your I'm exaggerating there. Okay? <laughs> It's not, that's not for me to say. But to believe that the, 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 when those stories are so clearly about Jesus, and so clearly about various aspects, and if you want to hear my sermons, I did a seven-week series on the seven chronicles of Maria, in which I talked about the Christian themes in that. Um, if, if people can't see the significance of that behind the literary devices which he used, you know, where Eustace turns into a dragon and where there is an evil witch, you know, and all of that kind of stuff, if people think that's the point instead of the great truth behind it, then I feel sorry for them. You know, I really do. Carol. And I think it's worse that they lead other people astray. Because as somebody who hears that and, and thinks, well, that's dumb, they're going to think all Christians are dumb. And they're going to think, I think it dishonors God. It does. I mean, in, in as far back as the early 400s, so 1,600 years ago, 
St. Augustine said, don't say stupid things. <laughs> no, because non-Christians hear you saying stupid things like that. Mm -hmm. And then, they, exactly what Carolyn said, and then they, they don't think any of the Christian faith makes any sense. You blow your witness. You know, if you don't use your head, if, you don't, if you're not smart about this stuff, if you are not a good student, if you don't represent things that are true and not just what somebody told you, then you are actually defaming the name of Christ. You are causing people not to want to take it seriously. And, and Augustine, 1,600 years ago, said, don't do that. And it has not changed since, even before Augustine. But it's still true. People say things like that. They, they lead people astray, and non-Christians look at that and go, what is wrong with those people? Don't do that. Yeah, so you can read the powder books. I think they're fine. As long as you don't decide from that you're going to go out and try to become a, a witch or a warlock or whatever, or look down on muggles, then I think you're okay. <laughs> Lynn? Um, don't you think there's, well, there's lots of types of Christians, but there's those Christians who are really thinking people um, who um, live what they believe in and um, believe what they truly thought about. It's not just, I was told this, so that's what I believe. And, Therefore, if, if they're uh, a thinking Christian, a uh, thinking human being, even, they're not going to make those stupid statements. I mean, I have a father in law who made those statements to my children, and they just sat down and wailed because they were, you know, six or seven years old, and, <laughs> and they knew the Narnia stories, etc. And, and they couldn't even read yet, but when they heard the stories, they said, He's Jesus. He's Jesus, and their eyes lit up on me. They became so excited. And the same with Harry Potter, my grandchildren. Uh, you know, that was a new thing for them. And they lit up and said, oh, we've got to have good, you know, get yeah. some help, you know. It is true that there are people who, who have been <coughs> victims of that kind of thing, you know, where they don't know any better and they don't think about it. But an obedient Christian has an obligation to be a thinking Christian. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and what? Mind. Mind and strength. We cannot, it is not acceptable for us to the extent we have the ability. Now, God does not expect everyone who's a Christian to, to demonstrate a 150 IQ or whatever. But God does expect with whatever abilities we have that we are supposed to think about this stuff. We are going to, you know, be always prepared to give an explanation for the hope that is in you, Peter says but do so with gentleness and respect. Somebody who doesn't think about this stuff is not prepared to give an explanation for the hope that is in them. That's, that's sort of the, you know, the driving force behind our apologetics class, is to think about this stuff and to be able to explain it in a way that makes sense. So any Christian has a responsibility to be a thinking Christian to the extent that they are able. To say non-thinking things because you're just parroting what someone else told you, I don't care if it was a pastor or whatever else, without thinking about it, is being disobedient to Jesus. How's that? Mm -hmm. We've got to think about this stuff. Jesus told us to. And he told Peter to tell us to. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Uh, so, some people intentionally mislabel genres in order to, to mislead. I mean, I believe Rudolf Bultmann... Um, Unless he changed his ways, he found out after his death that he had been seriously wrong about his whole demythologizing scripture, that is, you know, taking all the miraculous, all the supernatural out of it. And yet he's one, he's, was the, he's the foremost theologian of the 20th century, and yet he didn't believe in any miracle, any supernatural, any anything like that. Jesus couldn't have been resurrected, or raised Lazarus from the dead, or walked on water, or stilled the storm, fed the 5,000, or anything else. And yet... Um, if he didn't repent on his deathbed, I think Wolfman was up for a big surprise, you know, uh, when he woke up wherever it was. All right. Genre interpretation. This is a second way in which genre interpretation has been misused. Uh, in order to excuse one from the demands of Scripture. Oh, well, they don't mean literally, you know, that you have to give a, a, a significant portion to the church. As long as your heart's in the right place, you don't have to actually do anything. Hogwash. You do. Not Hogwarts. Hogwash. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yet that has commonly been the case. In fact, Soren Kierkegaard, the um, existentialist philosopher and very committed Christian, in fact, he was so 
against the nominal sort of watered-down, lukewarm Lutheran Christian that it, Christianity that existed in Denmark during his time, that he made himself such a gadfly, writing letters to editors and calling out, you know, uh, popular figures and theologians and public figures about their their lukewarm theology, that it became common in those days that when you wanted to tell your child not to pout or not to not to be bad spirited or not to be you know to, to stop acting like a child they would say oh don't be a sore it. I mean because he was seen as being this just this constant problem always unhappy about the way the world was in terms of their Christian faith uh, Kierkegaard said this Christian scholarship is the human race's prodigious invention to defend itself against the New Testament to ensure that no one can continue to be a Christian without letting the New Testament I'm sorry to ensure that one can continue to be a Christian without letting the New Testament come too close. In other words, sometimes we use scholarship. That's not to say that all Christian scholarship is bad. I don't think even Kierkegaard believed that. Um, but he, as much of a stick in the mud as he was. Um, but that sometimes, in order to be, be, in order to keep from having to take Scripture seriously, in order to do what it tells us to do, People water it down by, again, mislabeling the genres or interpreting it as, oh, well, that's just figurative speech. It doesn't mean you really have to do that. You know? um, and, and things like when, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. No one comes to the Father but by me. The number of people say, well, Jesus there is, doesn't really mean no one can come to the Father but by him. That's hyperbole. No, that's not hyperbole. That doesn't have any marks of hyperbole. There's no, there's no impossibility to that. It's a statement of fact. And yet, that's one that people who want to say, oh, you don't really have to believe in Jesus. You'll be okay anyway. That's one that they try to change the genre interpretation of that passage and others that say Jesus is the only way in order to make it that, you know, I don't have to really believe in and love and serve Jesus. I don't have to really believe he was the Son of God. You know, even though Paul says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And yet they'll say, well, I, I don't want to publicly confess it because I might offend somebody. And I don't, want to, I don't really believe he was raised from the dead, although I think he was a great guy. Well, then you're not there. Okay? I'm being a little bit hard today because I did a driving traffic. <laughs> traffic and drivers around here are hard enough on a good day, but when you're late and you're trying to rush, they're the devil's own way. <laughs> Alright, so these are some general principles with regard to interpretation of genre and why genre is important. Let's talk about the fact that there are some genres found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Some types of literature that are reflected in Old and New. The first and most common, as I mentioned earlier, is historical narrative. This is the recounting of factual events or historical facts, which is why it's called historical narrative. It makes up about 60% of the Bible, both Old and New Testament. Right? Um, however, you the, the, first, the first 11 chapters of Genesis there's some disagreement as to how to interpret those, what genre they are. Are they, are they sort of a really generalized kind of historical narrative? Are they allegory? You know, what are they? Uh, talking about the great events like, like the Tower of Babel and the Flood, etc. Uh, people differ on that, and I think legitimately differ on that. There, there's not a lot of content there. In 11 chapters, we have the four great events of ancient history. You know, there is the creation, the fall, uh, the Flood, and the Tower of Babel. Well, but when you get to chapter 12, which is the introduction of Abraham and his, uh, or Abram and his wife Sarai, who later are renamed Abraham and Sarah, and then their their sons Isaac and Ishmael, actually in order of, of arrival, Ishmael and Isaac, and then from Isaac Jacob uh, and his brother Esau, and from Jacob the twelve tribes of Israel, and what happened with all of them. That clearly <coughs> is historical narrative. There are people who say they don't believe it, but that's a different question. It is presented as historical narrative, a series of historic events that occur. And so you, you clearly have in the Old Testament, and in fact in the Old Testament, the books that are predominantly, if not entirely, historical narrative are Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, 
Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. All of those clearly are presented as historical narrative, the telling of historical events. Um, so, in, in the New Testament, by the way, we obviously have the Gospels and the Book of Acts. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some, like in, in some of Paul's writings, he will tell about where he was, he and, he and Timothy went to this place and they did this thing, but that's not really the purpose, that's not the, the primary genre of those. Those are epistles, those are personal communications to a, to a person or to a group of people. And so that's a different genre, even though there may be historical facts. And that's one of the things, is that it's, there's a lot of intermingling, or interspingling, as my wife's family says, uh, of, of events, um, of, of various kinds of genres. And so usually when we're talking about a passage, we're looking at what is the predominant uh, genre of that book or of that section of a book or of a passage. Okay. Now, several principles we need to look at with regard to understanding and interpreting historical narrative. One, it's often not obvious what the purposes are for the authors of biblical historical narrative. So it's sometimes more difficult to get at author intent. You'll remember previously we talked about what was the, one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is what was the author trying to accomplish in communicating this to whoever you originally sent it to? Well, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell in a given historical narrative. What, what's, real, what's the real purpose of telling this story about the things that happened? You know, it's not just, oh, I think I'll write this down. It occurs to me that I don't think anybody's written that story before, so I'll write it down. Not if it's in the Bible. There is more intentionality about everything we find in Scripture than a sort of casual recording of events. One of the ways that you can overcome this in, in doing biblical interpretation of historical narrative is to ask the question from the author's point of view, whether you're talking about Moses writing the book of Genesis or uh, Paul, the Luke writing the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, if you say to yourself, putting yourself in, say, Luke's position, I, Luke, have told you this story because... Well, Luke is actually an easy one because Luke tells us right at the first of his book, you know, what his goal is. He addresses it. He, he dedicates it to Theophilus. We don't know exactly who Theophilus was. But in, he says, uh, I'm, I've sought to give an orderly account of the events of Jesus and his life. So that, and he says, so that people might have faith. And so we're clear about that one. But in other places, one technique you can use is to say, I, Moses, am writing this book of Genesis so that, and what's the answer? You know, how do you fill in the blanks there? Or I, Joshua, am writing this story, history of the book of Joshua because blank. That is one way you can help get to what was the, uh, the human author or the inspired author's intent in any biblical narrative, all right? Secondly, context is always important. Context means, in this case, we don't mean historical context as much as we do um, context within the rest of Scripture. You know, what comes before it, what comes after it? Where is it embedded? Um, context is especially important for interpreting historical narrative because it's hard to, to, to interpret. And so when you're looking at, at, for instance, the Gospel of John, is historical narrative but with a particular kind of theological bent. Well... John occurs as the fourth and last written of all of the Gospels. By the time John's Gospel was written, the first three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had not only been written, but had been widely distributed and widely read. And because of the context that we find, you know, the Gospel of John in between the synoptic Gospels and the book of Acts, it's been, and when we know it was written late, last of all, and the other books were available, that it, it is regularly understood, I don't know if any serious challenge is this, that John was probably asked by Christians to write his version of the gospel, but to do so, you know, you can hear them saying, you know, John, Brother John, we've got these other three stories about Jesus, but there's some stuff in there that's hard for us to understand. Could you maybe write your version and make a special point of helping us understand the sort of the theological stuff behind it? You know, why this stuff happened and what it means? And so the fourth gospel, occurring as it does after the three synoptic gospels, but before the story of the church growth and the Acts, is much more theological. And the context where it falls in Scripture helps us to understand that. 
And whenever you're looking at a smaller passage within historical narrative, what, what happened before and what happens after it is critical to understanding that. Okay? Editorial comments within the text often can guide you to an author's intent. There are a lot of places where the author will give you sort of little commentaries. Um, in the Gospels, for instance, one that just pops into my head is when the, uh, Peter, James, and John are with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they're, they're writing about their experience, and after Jesus is there with, with Moses and Elijah, and Peter says, Lord, why don't we build three booths here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah? And, you know, the author says there, um, he didn't know what to say. In other words, he was awkward and, and yet felt he had to say something because of this extraordinary experience. You will find little editorial comments like that often in the middle of historical areas. They will give you some commentary that will help you understand exactly what, both what the purpose is and also what the, you know, what, what's going on. You will run into a lot of repetition of words or concepts, and that's often a way for biblical authors to tell you what they thought was important, what they want emphasized. Um, so, uh, you get into that a lot when you get into Hebrew poetry, for instance. But whenever they re repeat words, repeat phrases, or give different words that mean the same thing for emphasis, then that should shine at you, shine out, and you say, that's important. You know, the author of this historical narrative really wanted to emphasize that, and so that must be important to them. And, this happens often, trustworthy characters often appear in the, in the historical narratives to tell us more clearly what's right and what the main message is. They'll be writing along historical narrative and then a character will be introduced. Uh, and sometimes mysterious characters, like Melchizedek. You know, Melchizedek, who is this strange, mysterious, priestly figure in the Old Testament that Jesus is later said to be in the line of Melchizedek, and yet he shows up and represents great truth in his interaction with Abraham uh, and Abraham's reaction to him. And so you'll, you'll, as you travel through the historical narratives, sometimes characters will show up. They might be mysterious characters, or they, you know, but they'll, they'll perform a particular kind of function. And if it's, if it's a character that is particularly noted as trustworthy or um, doing a significant act, pay attention to that, because that often is kind of the key to understanding the, whole, the important part of that whole historical narrative. Okay, does that make sense? Any question about that? And again, remember, historical narrative is rarely pure. Uh, throughout all the historical narrative of Old and New Testament, you've got the peppering of genealogies, you know, as you do in Matthew, for instance, uh, songs, proverbs, prophecies, letters, declarations of covenant agreements, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, but historical narrative is, a, is an important one to understand because it is 60% of the whole Bible. All right? Um, it's 11 o'clock. Let's take a 10 minute break. Okay. Let's talk about the next genre that is found in both Old and New Testament. It might be surprising to you to say this, but uh, that it's found in the New Testament. But they are books that are in the genre or passages in the genre of prophecy. Now, the word prophecy has various meanings. Most people, again, misunderstand it and think prophecy always means telling the future. Declaring something that has not happened yet, uh, that is, that's one meaning of prophecy, but that's not the meaning of prophecy. The most basic meaning of the word prophecy is the delivery of a message from God, or a spirit-inspired utterance through an appointed prophet, and that's true both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, that's why in the New Testament they talk about the gift of prophecy being one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, in fact, one of the most important gifts. Because preaching is a prophetic act. You are a, a preacher is a prophet, one who delivers a message from God. And so prophecy is any message coming from God through an individual who we would call a prophet. Has nothing to do with telling the future, necessarily. Yes? Um, would a prophet, I thought prophecy also would be, say, these uh, blood moons that are coming. That they would be a prophecy of... You're listening to all the wrong people. Sorry. <laughs> blood moons? Blood moons. Blood moons. Hooey. Hooey? Yeah. There's nothing to that. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, you've been reading Hagee, probably. <laughs> um, there's, a, and there's a show Sid Roth has on the, okay. about uh, all the prophecies. Yeah. Um, 
Well, what can I say? I don't think there's anything to that. In fact, I think it's really damaging. I think it's destructive. Okay, so they're saying, more or less saying the sun and the moon are, have, are prophecies of what's going to happen as well. You were just saying individual, so you're just saying... Well, a prophecy is a, a message from God. And that doesn't mean something that's going to happen in the future necessarily. It could. There are prophetic messages that have to do with something that's going to happen in the future. But that's not the meaning of the word prophecy. Prophecy is any telling of a message that God gave for the people. Okay? Okay. Sorry to react to that, but that whole... You're not the first person that has come up to me even in our church and said, Oh, the blood moons and blah, blah, blah. The, That's fear-mongering to a great extent. People are, are made to be fearful for that. And, you know, our God is not a God of fear. Yes? I, I just wanted to ask then with regards to the Magi and the, and the star and the... And leading towards, uh, you know, Jesus, right. following that, where would you put that? Well, that's not, uh, prophecy is a written, you know, or a, or a spoken uh, thing. It's the, the Magi were partly responding to ancient writings that were about something to come. I'm not saying that prophetic writings can't talk about something in the future. I'm saying it's not limited to that. Um, and so there, there are ancient, a lot of ancient prophetic utterances, Isaiah, Je and Jeremiah, elsewhere, about what was to come and fulfillment of God's covenant promise to his people. And part of that promise to his people was that all people will be blessed through them. So the Magi were following the star. They asked about Beth, you know, they asked where he's to be born. And uh, when they got to Herod's place, and Herod checked with his scholars, and they said, well, according to the Old writings, he will be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And so that was a prophetic statement about where the Messiah was to be born. So I'm not saying a prophetic writing, since we're talking about written genres primarily, cannot, cannot tell us something about the future, but that's not the only definition of it. I'm emphasizing that because most people think prophecy means telling the future. You know, the, the Gene Dixon biography was entitled A Gift of Prophecy. And they were talking about telling the future. That's not what. That's not technically what prophecy means. It can include that, but it's not limited to that. Okay? I think I've said the same thing about 30 times now. So, um, but prophecy is a message from God. Now, when interpreting prophetic writings, we need to make sure that we investigate the book's background, the date, and the author. When was it written? What were the circumstances of its writing? To whom was it addressed? And what do we know about them? What do we know about the author? Now. Since a prophecy is a message from God, it frequently is in the form, Old Testament form is, thus saith the Lord. In other words, thus saith the Lord means, here's a message for you from God. So that always is a prophetic statement, because it's the definition, a message from God. So whenever you read, thus saith the Lord, or again, it has been written in the Old Testament, meaning they're... they're Reciting or reminding of something God has said in the past in His holy in the holy writing, the canon of the Hebrew Bible. Now, in Jesus' time, one of the things that Jesus did, because part of Jesus' message was that He was greater even than the written law, He would say, um, "You have heard it was written, but I tell you." And so, those are prophetic statements that Jesus makes by by uh, going beyond what was written. But still, those are prophetic statements because those are messages in which Jesus says, but I tell you, and Jesus was the Son of God. And so, any time, in, in order to be able to understand correctly what, what a prophetic, you know, interpreting prophetic messages, you need to think in terms of who wrote it, when did they write it, who were they writing to, what was the, con the historical context, the whole kind of um, higher critical kind of stuff, you know, who the author was and what they were motivated by and all that especially in prophetic writing, because there's such a danger, like the, like the blood moons thing. People go off in weird directions on this stuff because they don't take into account what the original circumstance was, why it was written, who it was written by. We always, in terms of any Old Testament kinds of writings, we always have to think in terms of the first meaning, you know, the obvious meaning, which was for the time it was written. Every Old Testament writing has a meaning first and foremost for when it was written. And then in many cases, there also is a meaning that carries forth to modern times. All of the Bible, for instance, refers to Jesus in some way. 
Because all of the Bible has to do with the fulfillment of God's ultimate promises to his people. And Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that. So in that way, everything points to him. But people who take things like the blood moons or various other kinds of things completely out of context, without regard to what the original intention was, and then they project some meaning about you know, what's going to happen next Tuesday or a year from now or in the year 2015 or in the 20th of December or whatever, then they are violating this whole principle that we have to understand any prophetic uh, message needs to be seen in the context in which it was originally presented. Yes? The book of Revelation, uh, is that a prophetic genre? The book of Revelation has some prophetic aspects to it, but it's primarily considered an apocalyptic, and we're going to get to that in a minute. It's, it's a book, it's an apocalyptic literature, um, as is Daniel. And that, that the difference is defined, you, know, you can almost say anything is a, in Scripture is a message from God, and so to that extent, it's all prophetic writing. But um, it's apocalyptic partly because of the mysterious imagery, you know, the mysterious and symbolic imagery that exists. It, that's one of the characteristics of apocalyptic literature. Revelation, Daniel, there are a few other places in the Old Testament where that's true. Uh, a little bit in Ezra. So, um, but that's, that's a specific genre. Okay. All right. Um, again, context is important. It's when we take these things completely out of context. And when I say context there, I don't mean historical context. I mean context within Scripture. What comes before, what comes after. That helps us understand and interpret correctly. And again, most of the people who get screwy about the prophetic stuff, you know, from Hal Lindsey on, it's because they lift stuff out of Scripture and deal with it in isolation um, without either the historic, historical context or the literary context around it, the, the, what comes before and after it. One of the mistakes that we often make, um, and this is especially true with, with regard to the epistles more than any other, but it's true with much of it, is this stuff was written to be read in entirety. You know, when, when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans or the Corinthians or Ephesians or Galatians or to Timothy or Titus or whatever, he did not intend for us to pick one verse out and to build a, a doctrine on it. The letters were written to be read in their entirety. That doesn't mean we, once we understand them in their entirety, that we can't go back and say, well, here's a particular truth. That, you know, that we can talk about that Paul communicated. But when we try to do that in the absence of looking at the whole context, then we mess ourselves up. And that's no more, nowhere is that more true than in the prophetic stuff. All of these people who declare, you know, the world is going to end on the 20th of December, it's because they have taken a passage and they've lifted it out of context and they have read into it all sorts of things without regard to how it was intentionally um, intended by the author, who wrote it, what was the context, historical context, and what is the context within Scripture? And that's the thing that leads us in the wrong direction so often. Marvin? Well, it's not that they take one thing out of context, they take a dozen. They go through mm -hmm. the Bible and pick out a half a dozen or a dozen things and string them together to make their theory. And yeah. it sounds like they're very knowledgeable. You know, and you really have to go all to, the, to all those places and put them back into context and say, this is what they were really saying. Exactly. Yeah. And you also, the idea of Scripture interpreting Scripture, when people do that and they say, oh, this is what's going to happen because of the blood moons or because of the whatever, or whatever and this is when it's going to happen. Jesus said, no one knows the hour or the day, not even me. Jesus said, only the Father in heaven knows. So how in the world can people keep doing that when the rest of Scripture is very clear that we are not, in fact, the thing, only thing we know is that if we think we know, we're wrong. Well, we'll it's very clear about that. We'll buy their books, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some people read. Right? So. Yes. Okay. Um, question: Does God still speak to us individually today, and where does the Holy Spirit come in with regards to this? Well, anytime we're talking about interpretation, I mean, I'm talking about sort of techniques here. Anytime we're talking about biblical interpretation, what I'm saying is with the assumption that the Holy Spirit is the God. He is the one that that teaches us that causes us to understand that he is the one that gifts us with any ability of interpretation that we have. So that's a given. Okay. Now, the, the issue then is, um, it's, it's almost almost be easier to say, here are the things you need to watch out that you don't do wrong. Okay, I'm telling you, here are techniques like pay attention to the context, etc., etc. The Holy Spirit is the one that will teach us. 
The Holy Spirit is the one that will give us the right interpretation, but part of it is we need to make sure we're not doing something wrong in the front part that will cause us not to hear the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so the Holy Spirit is always involved in this. Whether God speaks us to, to us today, He does speak to us today, but the canon is closed. He does not give us, you know, we, we believe the Holy Spirit, God answers our prayers, the Holy Spirit teaches us, he gives us guidance. He gives us gifts for circumstances that in which we have particular needs. So yes, God still speaks to us today. But there is no new canon, meaning there are no new books that God gave us as his inspired and ordained word. Right? He, de he deals with us individually and as groups, but not in the same way. Okay. Another way to say that is God has not spoken something since the end of um, uh, John's writings that he intends for us to distribute and disseminate to all of the believers and say this is God's word to everybody. He speaks to me, he speaks to our church, he speaks to groups of people, but he has not since declared something that beyond what he's already declared, which is considered complete in, you know, in Christ, there is no new books that is supposed to be a new guide for everybody. This is why you know, the Book of Mormon, no, we don't believe it, or any of the other writings that have come subsequently. The canon was closed. And one of the last passages in the book of Revelation is, you know, curses on, uh, curse on him, anyone who adds to or takes away from, from this word. Okay. All right. So context, also figurative language. You need to understand that <laughs> prophetic writings often will include poetry and exaggerated expressions. Um, and that's to be expected. It, often, you know, like poetry and even prophetic statements, when you're reading through your, the scripture and you come to a section that's, that's set out differently, it's set out like in poetic lines, you know, they're shorter lines and they're staggered or they're inset, indented, etc. Those are, modern translations often will tell you where there is a special kind of language being used, whether it be poetry or uh, in some cases doxologies, you know, in the, in the New Testament. Um, so it will tell you that, but we need to understand that a lot of the prophetic statements, the messages that come direct from God, um, that there will be very figurative language. And when people try to take that figurative language literally, you get the blood moon kind of thing. Okay. Without understanding, that's probably not how that was intended. Um, we also have, within prophecy, there's two major kinds of prophecy. There is conditional and unconditional. And here again, we get into interpretive differences. The statement of unconditional, or I'm sorry, conditional property, uh, uh, prophecy, has to do with this will be if certain things happen. Unconditional prophecy has to do with something that is not changeable. Unconditional pro uh, prophecy especially is a statement of the unalterable purposes of God. God does not change. God's plan does not change. Prophecies with regard to the nature of God or His ultimate intention, those are unconditional prophecies. But then, much of the prophecy, for instance, in the Old Testament, when there was a prophecy to the Hebrew people, it had to do with, if you don't straighten up, then this is what's gonna, what it's going to look like. This is what's going to happen. Well, those are conditional prophetic statements, which means that that may not happen if you change, but it will happen if you don't for example. Make sense? And so again, sometimes we will read conditional prophetic statements as though they were unconditional, and so therefore draw absolutes from them, when in fact they were not intended to be absolutes. They will vary based upon how we respond to God's word list. Okay? Some other aspects of pro prophecy is Sometimes if it's difficult to understand what the prophetic meaning is, we have to remember that this word was given both to the original writer and the original audience, but also has been brought down to us today, and so it applies to us today. And if you're having trouble understanding what the original intention of the author was, think about how to back into it. Think about, well, how does, how does that affect us today? How do we read this today? And you, human beings have not changed a whole lot. To the extent they wear pants, they still put their pants on one leg at a time, okay? Um, we're still basically the same. And so sometimes if you're having trouble interpreting prophetic statements in the Old Testament especially, then step back and say, well, what does this mean to us today? And that might give you insights into what it meant originally and what the intent of the inspired author was. And when I say inspired author or the original author, it is, remember from last week, we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that we believe Scripture is of dual authorship. It is both 
um, written by a person, but by the verbal plenary inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. Meaning, God gave those people free will, free minds, their own creative ability, they write in the style which was their natural style, and yet, in a miraculous way, God superintends that act so that what ends up being written is exactly what he intended. So there is a dual authorship. And when the principle of verbal plenary inspiration and dual authorship says that scripture may mean more than what, it, you know, the, the sort of human version of what we read on the page, but it will never mean less. It will never mean less than the intent of the original human author. And so getting at the intent of the original human author is always a good place to start. We may then have to understand that God has a deeper meaning. Um, when Isaiah wrote all these passages about the coming of the Messiah, I don't believe he understood how all that was going to work out. I don't think he had a very clear sense. Oh, well, in 700 years from now, there's going to be a baby born in Bethlehem of a virgin, and this is what his life's going to be like, and then he's going to be betrayed and beaten and crucified, and that's what I'm writing about. I don't think he knew that. What he knew was God gave him these, these extraordinary, beautiful, painful messages about the Messiah who was to come without him understanding the rest. It means at the least what Isaiah intended, but we believe it means more than what Isaiah intended because we see it now in the light of Christ. Make sense? So whenever I say inspired author or original author or whatever, I'm talking about the human side of it. I'm not excluding the divine side ever. As we start with the human side, knowing if we can get a grip on that, we've got a good, we've got a good start. Also, we need to consider whether the prophetic predictions were fulfilled or as yet are unfulfilled. Now, that, and there are predictions. There are things yet to come. That's not, the, that's not the end total of all prophetic writing, but it is part of it. And there are some things that we see fulfillment. The Isaiah statements fulfilled in Jesus, born of a virgin in Bethlehem, etc., etc. There are some things, like the ultimate, um, well, in Romans, it says that the Jewish people will, in mass, come to believe in the Messiah. We haven't seen that happen yet. All right? But it's very clear in Romans. We also need to take special note of the apologetic nature of prophetic writing. Again, that doesn't mean to apologize. Apologia, which is where we get the word apologetics, means an argument in defense of the faith, or a reason why we believe the faith is true. In fact, apologia, the original Greek word, it means the opposite of to apologize, because it means to give an explanation for why you think you're right, not apologize because you were wrong. Okay. So when we say a special note of the apologetic nature, what do we find in the prophetic writing which, which establishes a reason for what we believe? that defends what we believe. The fulfillment of prophecy, a lot of Christians in, throughout the last 2,000 years have said the clear fulfillment of prophecy, Blaise Pascal was one of these people, said he considered that the fulfillment, especially the fulfillment in Christ, of the ancient prophecies was one of the strongest reasons that we could believe in that Jesus was who he said he was and that Christianity is true. So there is almost always an apologetic aspect or a, an, an, a thing that helps us understand and defend the Christian faith when we read prophetic writing. Okay? And then we need to understand the difference between the Old Testament era and New Testament era prophecy. Most of the Old Testament era prophecy was, um, it's a little unclear. I mean, we, had, we read the Old Testament in light of the coming of Christ. Of the beginning of the church of the new covenant. Now, when they wrote it, they didn't have all that understanding. That's why I say I don't think Isaiah understood everything that was going to be happening as, that was a fulfillment of his prophetic words. The New Testament prophetic writing is very much more understood by the authors. The New Testament prophetic writing is seen as a uh, an an expanding, not expanding on, but an explanation of, an emphasis of the prophetic fulfillment that had occurred in Jesus. So you don't find in very little in the New Testament writing, a little bit in, in Revelation perhaps, you don't see this, God is telling me this is going to happen and I don't understand what this means, but I'm counting on him to fulfill it, which is part of what was happening in the Old Testament. You don't see that kind of thing in the New Testament, nearly as much. 
It's much more matter of fact as to what has happened already. Okay, yes? Just a quick question. I can't remember in time and age. What's the difference um, in the era of the Old Testament and the New Testament? Is it thousands of years or hundreds? The oldest Old Testament writing was about 1400 BC to about 400 BC. So it's a thousand year period ending about four centuries before Jesus. The New Testament writing began in the 40s AD, so it's almost 450 years after the end of the Old Testament, uh, that intertestamental period. Uh, from about the 40s, which is Paul's writing is the earliest writing, or James, you know, the book of James is writing, James or Galatian, the first, the first of the books. And the last of the New Testament books was the book of Revelation, written in the 90s probably, almost close to the end of the first century. Because John lived longer, by far longer than anybody else, and died of natural causes. Uh, stories are that they tried to kill him and it didn't work, so he lived to a ripe old age. So, that gives you an idea. So there's 1400 BC to 400 BC, about in the 40s AD to about 90s AD, so that 50 year period there, okay? But there is almost 450 years separated, 400 to 450 years, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about some general aspects of interpreting prophetic writing. First, the authors of scripture, we need to realize they understood themselves and their task as occurring within the context of community, which is one of the things we get wrong a lot. So we have to interpret them as writing in the context of community. This idea of we, we you know, lone cowboys in Western culture, like this is, you know, me and you, God, that's not, if we're gonna accurately interpret the authors of scripture, all of them were people of community and they wrote the context of community. Most of their writing was to other people within their community. You know, like Paul, planted these churches, he's writing to other brothers and sisters that were part of the Christian community. And so we always need to understand that. It is not just me and Paul, just me and Peter, just me and James. There is a large community of the Christian faith starting in their day and all the way down till today. And we need to interpret in light of that. Okay. Um, Secondly, biblical authors assumed a continuity in God's dealing with his people so that earlier events are seen as clearly foreshadowing later ones. They didn't have this sense with, okay, there's the Old Testament and it's all about law and all about, you know, the Jews and that all ended. And now I've got the New Testament, it's all about Jesus and about Christians and the New Covenant, it's a completely different arrangement. Not at all. It is not... A versus B. This is the problem I have with dispensational theology. The idea that God has worked completely differently at various different eras, or dispensations, that's where that word uh, dispensationalism comes from, down through history. Um, that at each, each of these dispensations, God had a completely different way of dealing with things. I don't think that's at all biblical, and it's not consistent with our belief about the nature of God. God does not change. God did not deal with the Hebrew people you know, up to a point, you go, well, that's not working. I'm going to have to try something else. Maybe I'll send Jesus down there. God knew what he was doing from the start. And there is a continuum of that. And the biblical authors perceived that continuum. The Old Testament authors did not see, uh, you know, saw themselves as writing something. Even if they didn't understand, they knew there is more to this story. But wait, there's more. And the New Testament authors saw themselves as being at... You know, it's, it's sort of like if, if, the, if the first writers of the Old Testament, Moses, or, or the writer of Job, may, Job may be the oldest one in the Old Testament. If they sort of started at the bottom of the steps and every piece of writing was, was they're climbing the stairs of God's revelation to us, and we get to the book of Revelation and it's the top, top rung, that's the last revelation that we were given in Scripture, everybody on every rung had a sense that there was somebody before and there's somebody coming with the exception of... You know, John, who clearly says in Revelation, this is the last of the revelations we're going to get like this. But all of them, with the exception of the very first one and the very last one, all of them understood that they were part of a continuum of communication that God was doing. Something came before, something came after. Which again is one reason we don't just pick something out and isolate it from the rest of it and say, I'm building a doctrine around. The New Testament authors understood themselves as living in the age of eschatological fulfillment. Eschatological means the end times. Um, it means they understood that God, in sending Christ, 
in the sacrifice Jesus made for us in his death and resurrection, and in, then in the building of the church, the creation of the church, and the expansion of the church, they knew that they were part of God's final chapter. Now, that final chapter has taken 2,000 years already, but the age of the church, as it's called, um, where we are now, the New Testament writers understood that they were being called upon to communicate sort of the groundwork understanding of what was going to be God's, the fulfillment of God's plan. That everything that had come before was going to be fulfilled in the new age, in this new age. And I don't mean new agey, you know, like that kind of stuff, but the new church age. Okay? Good with that? And the New Testament authors believed all scripture were about Jesus as he was the fulfillment of all that had come before. Now we have to be careful with that. And I've said uh, in some of the classes before, I love Norman Geisler's work, you know, as an apologist, um, biblical scholar, etc. But his, uh, I did not use his book on New Testament uh, interpretation because everything he does in his book on New Testament interpretation, uh, I'm sorry, in Old Testament, uh, Old Testament interpretation, everything he does in the Old Testament, he puts everything in the context of how does this relate to the coming of Jesus. And while I don't think that might, that's inappropriate, that's only half the story. Because God had the Old Testament writings written by the original authors of the Old Testament for the Jewish people first. And then it also looks forward to the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to the Jewish people and all the rest of humanity that is to be found in Jesus. But we can't just make it about Jesus. It's got to be about more than that. Ultimately, however, Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise, every, every direction, every intention that God makes known in the Old Testament. He fulfills everything. Okay? Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to what? Fulfill it. Okay. Let's talk now about apocalyptic literature. And by the way, apocalyptic does not mean, oh my gosh, I'm scared everything's blowing up. That's not what that means. The word apocalypsis, it literally means a revelation, a revealing. And so that's why the book of Revelation, as we call it, was called originally the Apocalypse of John. You know, it is the revelation to St. John. Apocalypse, revelation, the revealing. So apocalyptic literature is writing such as Daniel in the Old Testament, Revelation in the New Testament, which reveals or unveils God's plans, especially by the use of symbolic and or mysterious imagery. Okay? Let's face it. Revelation especially can be very strange. In fact, it gets it can get it can seem so strange to us that it was one of the books that they took a long time deciding whether or not it really was from God and should be in the canon of Scripture. They finally decided it was and should be, primarily because it was by John. Yeah. And you know, it doesn't get much better than that. And so, but it is very strange in terms of the imagery and stuff. Now, characteristics of apocalyptic literature can include one. A very clear expectation that God is breaking into the present age to initiate a qualitatively different existence in the age to come. All things are being made new, it says in Revelation. Behold, the old is gone. And that's very much the, the, the message in apocalyptic literature. God is breaking into our existence to do something very different and new. So that's in, in Daniel. You know, whenever Daniel was having these visions, he was asked to interpret these visions. Well, these visions are, changes are coming. It was basically, in every case, the visions of Daniel had to do with that. Something different is about to happen. Okay. Next um, characteristic is the use of an angelic mediator or mediators to communicate God's messages. There are regular appearances of these sort of celestial beings, angels to communicate messages, etc. Um, we get that, again, I am using Daniel and Revelation as the two Old Testament and New Testament examples, but there are bits and pieces of this that occur in other places as well, kind of a popular literature. Um, there usually is a, is a description of a journey by a chosen human into the heavenly realms. You know, they are brought, you know, when Daniel is brought up in Daniel 7 and he is elevated to the heavenly realms and he sees God sitting on his throne, and he said, And there came forward one who was uh, one like the Ancient of Days, and to him was given all authority and power, etc. 
He's in heaven seeing this. The same thing is true in John's Revelation, where he, you know, he was brought up into heaven and was shown what heaven's going to look like. And he has these descriptions of the river of life and the light that came. No other light was needed except the light that came from the throne of God, etc. So this, and this experience of the heavenly realms. Then symbolic visions or dreams that describe both current and future spiritual realities and divine interventions. Um, these symbolic in the sense of seeing beasts with multiple heads and multiple horns, seeing statues that are made of, you know, a uh, head of gold and you know, chest of various, you know, all the way down to feet of clay, which is where we get that expression, he's got feet of clay. Um, these images that represent something that is, going, that is either happening now or will be happening in the future to express God's plan for people. There are visions of final divine judgment, what is going to happen eventually. This is why most people think apocalypse means, you know, everything's being destroyed. That's not what the word means, but that is one element of ap apocalyptic literature. There are warnings to the faithful of coming, it should be of coming, not or coming, of coming distresses and trials. Prepare yourself. It's going to get very, you know, the book of Revelation, for instance, you know, there is, there is the, um, the tribulation. There are various other ways in which it describes that Christians will be persecuted and that they must, and the, and the last part, the encouragement of the faithful to persevere until God intervenes, that you must stand strong. You know, you must be willing to withhold, and to withstand this, to hold against all the evil because God will come. God will make it right. All of these are elements of apocalyptic literature. And it can be, you know, I've taught Revelation, Took a long time for people twisting my arm before I did, because it's not easy. Um, and it's all one of the reasons it's not easy is because people always they they've heard somebody say all kinds of things that I don't think are true or accurate about it, and so everybody's got these preconceptions about what it really means. Quite often, not true. They're, you know, um, to many people, I think they look at the Book of Revelation as though it were an occult document. They won't say that. You know, because it's in the Bible. But they treat it like that. You know, that it's somehow magical. Uh, and that all the symbolism in it is magical. I don't think that's how we should read it. Um, okay, let's talk about genres occurring primarily just in the New Testament. First, and perhaps most popular, are the parables. A parable is a short fictional story, meaning it's not, it's not telling a real, it's not a historical narrative. It's not telling something that happened to real people. It's fictional meant to illustrate a moral or religious principle, especially by using some sort of comparison. You may not have noticed that. But usually there is some comparison between the Samaritan versus the Levite, you know, and then the, there, there's a comparison between different kinds of things. The pearl of great price is compared to, and all of the different parables are either comparing people and their reactions to things. The parable of the prodigal son, you have the, the son who leaves and the son who stays. You've got comparisons all the way through. That's one of the dominant things that is a characteristic of parables. Now, historically, parables uh, were, and I'm talking like back in the time of origin, uh, and subsequent, all, all between, between the 200s and the 1500s, you know, for over a thousand years, the predominant way people interpreted uh, parables were by allegory. And what that means is they would take every part of parable and assign some New Testament meaning to it. You know, like the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan is Jesus. You know, and the man who was beaten is us. And the, the Levite that walks by is the law. And the priest that walks by represents the, you know, the prophets. And the donkey represents something. And the innkeeper represents the church. And, you know, and, and they interpreted every piece of it as being representative of something else. Well, when we got to the Reformation, the reformers, and some people had argued and complained about that again earlier, uh, the Antiochene school of interpretation from Antioch, they never did go for allegory in that way. But the dominant message, in order that some of the great early church fathers were really into this. Um, when you got to the Reformation, Calvin and Luther and others said, this is wrong, you know, Luther being beer swilling German, he was not kind in his references to, um, to allegory. 
you know, he called them whimpering and simpering and stupid and small-minded and weak-minded and all kinds of stuff. Uh, John Calvin didn't use quite the same language, but Calvin, the great theologian, he said this is not the way to do this. And that there is nothing really for us to benefit from allegor allegorical understanding of the parables or anything else. They didn't use it just on the parables, but the parables have been special victims of that. And so now, since the Reformers, the Re Reformation, we tend to want to read the parables much more for the plain meaning that would have been heard by the original listeners. Now, that when I say the original listeners, that means we need to have some historical and cultural context. For instance, uh, just one quick example, when we, um, when we read that the prodigal son leaves home and he spends all his money and he, he can't make a living and he is taking care of the pigs and he literally is in the pig pen with them feeding them and he's, he got so hungry he wanted to be able to eat the pods that were being given to the pigs. Well, for a Jew, that was the lowest, le you know, sort of being crucified. That was the worst possible thing. That was the lowest you could ever fall in life is to take care of pigs that were unclean animals. And so a lot of the kinds of meanings that we get are, we, the more we understand about the original listeners and their culture and historical context, the more they will mean to us. But now, again, the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal son shows up and his father runs out to greet him. And he puts a ring on his finger and a robe on his shoulders and shoes on his feet and they prepare a banquet. The allegories, every one of those things had some special meaning having to do with the, you know, the end of the world and God's return. The ring meant one thing and the robe meant something and the shoes meant something and the banquet, you know. And we don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, but that's the way it used to be done. We need to understand that a primary theme in the parables of Jesus always is the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God, which was himself. He said the kingdom of God is in your midst. He talked more about the kingdom of God than anything else. And every parable he talks about, he gives, is in one way or another about the coming of the kingdom of God and the discipleship that is required in order for us to be ready and acceptable for the kingdom. That's what all of the parables boil down to. Yes? Can I ask uh, just a question? Um, what was the meaning behind the son that stayed behind and he was uh, talking to his father about what he's done and how come he, you know? I don't think there is any allegorical meaning. Okay. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a very human reaction. He right. stayed there and he worked and he worked in the field and his little brother had taken his inheritance, you know, part of the estate and run off and wasted it in drinking and carousing and running around and then when it was all spent and poor, he comes back. Now I remember the prodigal son came back saying, my father's servants eat better than I do. And so I will go back and ask my father, I don't deserve it, but I'll go back and ask my father if he will just let me be a servant. So he wasn't coming back ready to claim more inheritance or anything like that. He comes back and the older brother, understandably, I think, from a human point of view, is upset. I've been here the whole time working. You, he comes back and you give him all the stuff and you throw a big party and everything else and you won't even give me, you know, a goat, I think it is, to, to have a party with my friends. And his father says, you have been here with me all the time, you know, and for me to love and but my son was dead and now he's alive again and so we need to celebrate. So I think he reflects human pride, you know, but all the things that are obvious in that. There's no hidden symbolism, you know, he doesn't represent uh, the Catholic Church as opposed to be good Protestant, you know, or whatever. It's nothing like that. It's simply, he represents the very human reaction and the fact that that's not how we should understand it. We should rejoice in all those. I mean, some people, some people get upset when particular sinners turn to Jesus. They really do. Well, they, they've lived such a horrible life, I don't think they have a right. People say that kind of stuff. Jonah said that. Jonah was sent to preach to the Ninevites, and when he preached to the Ninevites, and they actually converted, he stomped his little feet and said, Argh! I don't like this! Well, people act the same way today with somebody that they don't like uh, is converted. Well, yes? Yeah, I actually did hear a sermon where, where the preacher was talking about the, the other son, the so-called good son, mm -hmm. and pointed out that he was full of duty, but he was really lacking in love. Exactly. Um, when he saw how happy his father was that this guy had come home and he knew that the brothers restored to the family. 
he only thought about like what does that mean to me? You know, like, I'm not the shining star anymore. You know, right. I'll, I'll come. You know, it's all me, me, me. Right. And, and so he was he was okay as far as duty went, but he was really lacking in love. And I think that's all very true. And and that's what I mean when I talk about a plain meaning. You know, that that's 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 a, a, an exposition of the very human way that he reacted and that we are in danger of reacting. But it's not like saying, okay, he symbolizes the Pharisees, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Uh, it's the very plain meaning that we understand that would have been understood by the people who heard it first. Okay? Um, a good first step in parable interpretation is to determine the main point or main points of the parable. Every parable has one or more points. Some New Testament scholars are especially have said um, there's always only one point. Some have said there's always two points. Some say there's four, five, six, seven. But you need to read it in terms of what is the main point or points, not to get too carried away, the main point or points in any given parable. And to get at that, you can ask certain questions. Who are the main characters and what do they represent? Again, not what do they represent allegorically, but what do they represent in terms of human nature, in terms of you know, goodness or evil or whatever. Um, what happens at the end? You know, these all have a conclusion, and the way they end is an important thing for us to understand how to interpret them. What happens through the direct discourse between characters? In those conversations is where, in the conversation between characters in a parable is often where we find the real significant message. Um, who or what gets the most space in the parable, and why? What do they talk about the most? There's a reason why they're structured the way they are. And then... What striking or unexpected details stand out? You know, there are, there are sometimes, you'll be reading along, and if you're new to, the, to a particular parable, and then a little real quick left turn on you or something, well, wow, I didn't see that coming. Um, well, what does that mean? If something like that happens, uh, striking, unexpected action, details, events, whatever in a parable, that usually is an indication that there's something really important there. Um, but, again, not all details have special meaning, like the example that the ring and the shoes and the robe and the banquet don't all have, each have a very specific detailed meaning that we need to try to allegorically interpret in the prodigal son story. No. But um, what would be the example of the, the, the servant well, I'm talking about striking details? Sometimes we've heard these stories so often we don't even get them. We don't even realize. You know, the, the um, servant that came in to master and he said, you owe me 10,000 talents. This was like $100 million or something. I mean, it was a huge amount of money. It would be today. Just ex unbelievable. It wasn't 100 million, but it was millions and millions of dollars. The equivalent of it. And he says, oh, you know, please just give me some time and I'll pay you back. And he, and the master said, well, okay, I forgive your debt. And the guy goes out and he immediately sees someone who owes him like $10, the equivalent of almost nothing. And he says, and he grabs him and chokes him and says, pay me what you owe me. And he says, oh, but just give me a little time and I will pay you back. And he says, no, and he has him thrown into debtor's prison. Well, the details of like millions of dollars being forgiven versus that person who had been forgiven of that huge debt, throwing someone into debtor's prison because he couldn't pay him 10 bucks or 15 bucks. The detail of that carries with it, you know, that, that's one of those unexpected details. Who would have thought that much money, that little money? And yet, that is sort of the extent of God's forgiveness for us compared to how little it means that we have to forgive other people. You know, God forgives us for extraordinary things. And when we forgive others, it's, it's almost nothing by comparison. Okay, there's an example where the details behind that Sometimes, really, you know, the, the striking aspect of those details carry the weight. All right? Other genres that occur just in the New Testament. Um, most noticeably, the biggest part of the, and this is, I say the biggest part, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are one-fourth of the whole New Testament. You may not notice it, but those are both long books. Luke is the longest Gospel, and the Book of Acts is a long book about the story of the church up until the time of Paul's delivery to Rome. But um, within the New Testament, the thing that we see there are more of are epistles or letters. These are 21 of the 27 books in the, the New Testament. Um, epistles, which is the old word for letter, 
all it means, an epistle is a letter, were personal communications written either to individuals or to groups of individuals, that is, church congregations. We break them up into two parts. There are the epistles of Paul, which are 13 of the 21. The epistles of Paul are not chronologically ordered. Those of you who have been in classes, we've talked about that a lot before. They are roughly presented in terms of size, with Romans, the first one being the longest. It was not the first one written, Galatians was. And then, by size, but then the ones that were written to the same churches, like 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 1st Corinthians is the second longest letter, but then they stick 2nd Corinthians after it. 1st Thessalonians, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, etc. So you've got Romans, uh, the, the letters written to the church in Rome, the church in Corinth, the church in Galatia, the church in Ephesia, or Ephesus, excuse me, Ephesia. Uh, the church in Philippi, and the church in Col uh, Colossae, and the church in Thessalonica. And then you have four individuals, or three individuals, four letters. Paul wrote twice to Timothy, once to Titus, and once to Philemon. Timothy and Titus were, uh, were assistants of his, disciples of his, people he, he taught. Timothy he refers to as his son. They were very close. Philemon is a friend who he's writing to in order to get him to take back a slave, and he says. Um, but these are written either to groups of people, and they are named according to who they're written to, not who wrote them. The second group of letters, of which there are eight, are called the general epistles, or sometimes the Catholic epistles, which means universal. The reason they're called the Catholic or universal epistles is that whereas Paul's letters were written to a particular place in church or a particular person, the Catholic or general epistles were intended to be read by everybody. They're more universal. The book of Hebrews, the author is unknown. The reason why it is the first of the general epistles after Paul's epistles is because early on, some people thought Paul had written it. The book does not say who the author is. But um, I don't think anyone seriously thinks that, that no one who's a scholar who reads this thinks that Paul wrote Hebrews. While the message of Hebrews is not inconsistent with Paul's writing, it is very different. It is very much Jewish. It is the most Jewish of all the, the writings probably in all of Scripture. Um, that's why it's called the Hebrews, the book, book, the writing to the Hebrews. But because it was thought by some early people to be written by Paul, they put it at the, you know, after the rest of Paul's writing. Um, that's why it sort of comes in the middle. It is the only one that is of the general epistles that is not named for its author. The others are James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude. Those are the authors of those books. And the reason they're put in that order is because in Paul's writings, he says, I went down to Jerusalem, and I met the pillars of the church, James, Peter, and John. And because those are listed in that order in Paul's writings, that's the order they put them, as though that were some, I don't think that order has any particular significance, but that's the, how they decided how to order them in the, in the New Testament. Jude is not mentioned anywhere. Jude was, like James, a half-brother of Jesus. His name actually was Judas, but they used Jude because Judas by that time, of course, had come to have a very negative connotation. So people who were named Judas within the Christian church, they tended to call Jude. Hey, Jude. Okay, so epistles. Let's talk about how we interpret these. First, we need to understand the epistles are not abstract theological treatises. Now, Romans has a lot of theology in it. It is the most theological of all the New Testament writings after John, the Gospel of John. But we need to read them in terms of addressing the specific concerns and problems of people or groups within the church. Now, Paul had never been to Rome. Paul was not aware of any particular problems in Rome, as far as we can tell. And so he was writing a more general kind of, here's what the Christian faith is all about in the, in the book. But one of the reasons he did it is because he'd never been to Rome, and he wanted to make sure that they had a solid theological foundation for their belief. And so he writes the book of Romans as a general kind of theological letter. But it is still written to a group of people in a church. Because these are written to particular churches, particular individuals, or groups of individuals, we need to especially pay attention to the historical and cultural context. When you read the book of Corinthians, you need to know something about what the city of Corinth was like. That it was a major center for some of the, uh, the pagan cult practices. Particularly, you know, the church in Corinth was having trouble with immorality. Well, it helps you to understand that if you understand that the temple of Aphrodite, the love goddess, was one of the major temples in Corinth. And that temple prostitution was practiced by everybody. 
And so immorality was something they sort of took for granted, and the church was having problems because they were still acting that way. And so Paul writes the book of Corinthians. And so there's an example where understanding the historical and cultural <coughs> context of a particular setting will help you interpret a book. We need to remember we have only one side of the conversation when we read the epistles. We don't know what had happened exactly that caused Paul to write or James to write or Peter to write these things. We don't know some of the exact things they were responding to. We know there was immorality. You know, Paul will say, I'm horrified to hear the man asleep with his, wife, with his uh, father's wife. We don't know what that's all about. We don't have any more details than what we read. So it's like listening to half of a telephone conversation. And you say, who was that? What, what were you talking about with regard to blah, blah, blah? Well, we need to recognize some humility on that. We do the best we can to interpret the other half of the conversation, but we don't have the other part of it. Yes? Does Josephus uh, deal with any of this? No. 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 Josephus does not get into details about that's cities and... And Josephus does not deal with any of the scriptural stuff. You know, Josephus was not a believer. Uh, he, he wasn't a very good Jew. You know, he had he had deserted the Jewish army because he thought the Romans were going to win. Uh, he was a general in the Jewish army, and he went over the Roman side. So he he's valuable as a historian for giving us a general historical context, but he does not deal with any specifics with regard to any of the things the scripture addresses. Okay. Um, we also need to uh, interpret in terms of I said it's important to see the whole context of letters, especially the epistles more than anything else, to read the whole thing. But when you get into interpreting them, some of the longer letters especially, you need to break up into smaller pieces. And that may not always mean take a chapter, because some of the chapters, you know, some of the chapter breaks in the biblical books are in weird places. Most of them are okay, but some of them are in strange places. But if we're going to do any serious analysis or interpretation of the epistles, we will have to... Look at them all in context, but then identify sections or segments that we can focus on in terms of interpretation. Having said that, we need to try to have an overall firm grasp on the organization of the letter because they were meant to be read in their entirety. You don't, you know, if you if you write a letter to someone, you know, a family member or, or a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, whatever, you write them the letter, you don't expect them to say, well, I'm going to read page three first, and then next week I'll sit down and read page one, and then... After that, I'll decide what other, you know, maybe I'll read the second paragraph of the second page. You know, that's how we treat these letters that were written. That's not how you read a letter. Now, it's okay. You read the whole letter and understand the whole context, but then go back and I really need to understand more about what, what Carolyn was meaning when she wrote me this paragraph, you know, this second paragraph here. But first, you have to know the whole thing. And we tend to start out by breaking it all up in pieces. And then finally, we need to focus on what words are important. Uh, oh, next, next time. Focus on what words are important what they mean. There are key words that you get in the epistles, key theological words. Um, when they talk about the church, or when they talk about being justified in Christ, or to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit, what do those words mean? Because that's how we get to understand and interpret accurately what Scripture, uh, what the epistles say. And then what does the message mean for us today? There is a reason this has come down for us 2,000 years later. It wasn't just for the Corinthians. What does it tell us about immorality in our lives as Christians. You know, The letter written to the uh, Thessalonians, a lot of it had to do with uh, reassuring them that Jesus was going to return and how should we act until then. Don't, you know, don't give up faith. He hasn't come back yet. There's somebody lied to them and said he's already been back and you missed him. Um, and so how are we? You know, I, I use Thessalonians probably more than any other passage when I'm doing memorial services because there is that absolute assurance that he is yet to return. He hasn't come yet. And when he returns, he will call us to be with him. Okay. Any questions about any of that? That's done yet?